Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dr. Taylor Clem. I'm with UF IFAS Extension in Alachua County. Uh, today, we have one of our Master Gardener volunteers, Brenda Campbell. She is going to be speaking all about seed starting. Uh, she's even showed like how to do an indoor grow light that you can create. And we'll even talk a little bit about composting. So Brenda, you know, she's one of those master gardener extraordinaires, you know, a homesteader. And so she's done this presentation before and we're incredibly excited that she's able to come in and present this uh, for us. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, earlier, feel free to use the Q&A box uh, to send us any of the questions that you have. And um, I'd like to hand it over to Brenda. And uh, Brenda, uh, feel free to take over. And again, thank you for joining us. And thanks, everybody, for signing in. Hi, thanks, Taylor. I, like you said, my name is Brenda Campbell. I'm an Alachua County Master Gardener. And today we're going to talk about starting seeds indoors. And then we're going to build a grow light that you can easily do at home yourself. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about composting. So let's get started. Uh, first, well, why should you start seeds indoors? One of the good things is that by starting your seeds now, by the time it gets warm enough to plant outside, you will have seedlings just the perfect side to, to put right out in your garden or pots. And if you're anything like me, you probably peruse all those seed catalogs. You know you have such a better variety buying seeds than being stuck with buying transplants or seed seedlings in the in the store. You just have a few varieties where if you buy seeds, you can pick whichever variety you want. If you start them inside, you control their environment. It doesn't matter if it's freezing outside, you can you can keep the environment right for them to be healthy until it's time to go outside. Usually when you start seeds, you have a lot of extra in case, in case you have some failure. So then you can share them. And that's, I love swapping plants with my friends. And another big thing is you save a lot of money. Everybody knows how much those, those six packs and nine packs of, of transplants cost. And you save a lot of money buying seeds or just, or sharing seeds with your friends. And there's a lot of, um, different ways germination can be triggered. It could be by moisture, temperature, and light. And um, depending on the plant, some seeds, some vegetable seeds like cabbage, tomatoes, when the seed is stored, the embryo is almost fully developed. So they will germinate very quick. When it gets those triggers, like moist, the right temperature and the right moisture, they will just germinate quickly. Then other seeds, once they get the trigger, they still have to form before they actually germinate. And that's why some of the plants, for instance, parsley, uh, dill, they it seems like they take forever to germinate. It's because the seed wasn't in the same stage as some of the other seeds. And some like spinach, there's actually a coating on it that inhibits germination until it's broken down by the right conditions in the soil. And some vegetables will transplant easier than others. So we're not going to go over everything on this list, but you see that certain ones, if you plant them in a flat or in little cells, they will easily transplant into your garden, where other ones aren't so happy getting transplanted. It'd be better to just plant them directly into the ground or plan like a larger pot so you don't disturb them as much when you replant them. And so to decide when you should start your plants, it depends. Different plants, some will say plant six weeks before your average last frost or eight weeks. Um, and our average last frost for the Gainesville area or we're in 9A and other parts of Alachua County are 8B, but around March 10th. So just count back from there, just in, on the seed packet, it will tell you like how soon to start indoors. Some will tell you not recommended to start indoors. And just you know, depend on what, sh what it is. We know that our area, the last frost date is around March 10th. That doesn't mean you can just throw everything out there. <laughs> you still have to watch the weather. You might have to be prepared to cover. So first of all, you need to choose a container. You can use just homemade things from around the house, or you can use commercial planting trays. You just want to make sure whatever you use has plenty of drainage. Um, if your the soil stays too wet, it will encourage disease and then not enough oxygen gets into the soil. Um, so just want to make sure you have plenty of drainage. 
and you can use like the, the commercial cells you can use paper cups you could just use a flat i've uh tried using the the paper tubes from paper towel or toilet paper and you can make little tubes out of newspaper even they have a little device that you can roll your own paper pots and um as long as they're about three to four ounces or a half to a third of a cup, that should be adequate to get the uh, seeds started. You want to make sure, though, that you have something to protect the surface from water, have a tray or something underneath it, because your floor or the surface it's on, when you water it, you don't want it to get damaged by water. If you were using containers you used before, you want to make sure you clean them really well, because in case there's any disease organisms on them, you can use bleach, vinegar, or put them in the sun. So when you're going to start seeds, if you're going to use a, a commercial mix, make sure it's a seed starting mix and not a potting soil. Seed starting mixes, they're sterile and they're very light. They allow water and oxygen to be retained in the soil because germination requires oxygen and in the soil because it doesn't get, it can't really get oxygen from the air until the plant germinates and there's leaves to for respiration. So it's depending on getting oxygen through the soil. So you want a nice light uh, seed starting mix and always use fresh try not to use a leftover bag from last year because just hanging around in your shed or garage it could have other bacteria or moisture and it could have be growing pathogens that could damage your seedlings and then some people like to make their own seed starting mix you can use uh, peat moss coir uh, compost if you use compost be sure you heat it because there could be pathogens in there. Um, people use vermiculite, worm castings. So there's different recipes available online if you want to be brave and use your own. I've had real good luck with uh, commercial seed starting mixes. So when you're ready to plant, first you want to pre-wet your uh, planting medium. And you can even just let it sit for a few hours and, if you, and uh, let it absorb. Um, it should be form a loose ball. If you get a handful, you don't want it to be like squeezing water out of it. You want it to just kind of hold its shape a little bit. And then if it's too wet, you could drain it and let it stand longer and let it just keep absorbing more water. So whether it's your trays or your cells, you would fill it to the top and then tap tap the container to let it settle and then fill some more. Tamp very lightly, but you want to make sure it's a quarter to a half inch from the top. So when you water it, you don't want the water to, to go over the edge. You want it to stay in the planter. And then you're ready to plant your seeds. So the depth of the seed depends on the size of the seed. It's usually two to three times the seed diameter. And I've used um, a, like a chopstick or a pencil to like poke little seeds in the soil looks and that works really well because they kind of stick to your fingers and if I, I do it in the cells I do about three seeds to a cell you'll have more than you need because later you don't know maybe they won't all germinate and you can always thin them later and then if you're growing a larger plant with big huge seeds you might want to just put one seed in the cell but once you put the seed into the proper depth you want to tap tamp it lightly because you want the damp soil to be in contact with the seed. And for watering, you can water from the top with a with a watering can, you can use a spray bottle, or you can do bottom watering, which is you fill the bottom of the tray with a quarter inch of water, you wait 30 minutes and then you drain it. But be sure if you use paper cells like if you made your own out of newspaper or cardboard bo bottom watering does not work out well because it deteriorates the, the paper. So once the seeds are planted you want to cover it. You can use the commercial deli lid that comes with the um, tray. You can use saran wrap. I've used both with equal success and you want to put them in a spot where it's 60 to 75 degrees during the day and above at least above 50 at night. Um, you can use a heat mat 
to keep it warm, but just make sure that as soon as it germinates, you take take them off the heat mat because the too much heat after germination can cause the plant to get gangly. And then you want to they they can be in a dark spot. The light doesn't matter, of course, because the seed <laughs> is underground under the soil. But you want to really keep a close eye because as soon as they germinate, you need to get them into light. So once they once they germinate, the seedling has been using the fuel from the seed it, that has been stored in the seed. That's what it's been using to grow. And once it germinates, it's going to start making a transition to using its leaves for um, to get fuel. So it needs the light right away because if you wait, they, the plant can become weak and it's more disease prone. And you can just use fluorescent bulbs to get seeds started. The old fluorescent bulbs, they're the T12s, those work fine. And the newer, smaller bulbs, smaller diameter bulbs, the T8s, they work fine as well. They And they are more energy efficient. Um, some people think they need a special grow light with all the spectrums of light in order to start the seeds, where these are only going to be under this light six weeks, and then they'll be outside in the normal sun. If you were going to be trying to grow a plant its whole life indoors and it was going to you wanted it to produce fruit and flowers and seeds it would need different spectrums of light but just to get started to go outside in six to eight weeks of regular fluorescent light is fine and in fact the fluorescent light gives off a little bit of heat that helps and there's not a lot of information yet out about the led light as far as doing studies on that, but some people have used them with success, but we don't have good information on that. The, you wanna rotate your seed trays. The center of the tube seems to be stronger, so you might need to rearrange your trays every once in a while. And you, if you turn a fan on in the room or just set the fan, it will help um, air circulation. So sometimes it can get fungal damping off diseases. So circulation helps. Keep an eye, don't let it dry out. These plants are so tiny and vulnerable. If they dry out, they could die very quickly. And there's these few examples on the slide, just homemade ones that store easily, just you made from the one that is the triangular one would fold flat when it's not used. And then you can use regular utility shelf. And the one on the right, my husband built for me and, and it has a crank instead of uh, lowering the light with the chain, I have cranks to lower and lower and raise the light. Oh, speaking of that, you want the light within two inches, really, really close to the plant. And then as it grows, you would just raise the light up or lower the plant. So after the first leaves come up, as we said that there's a lull between using energy from the seed and then transitioning to getting energy from the light. So once the true leaves start forming, the roots really start forming, you can tell by the diagram. And by the time that happens, when the true leaves appear, the soil is pretty depleted. The starting soil has some nutrients, but by the time the true leaves appear, we're gonna need to feed it some some. So what you can use is any liquid fertilizer, use about a quarter strength, mix it with the water that you water it with, either the um, a spray bottle, a watering can, or the bottom watering. Just about every two weeks, add that little bit of fertilizer. And then when it's time to plant, you want to gradually expose them to the outdoors because they haven't been used to sun or wind. So seven to 10 days before you think you're gonna be putting them in the garden. Hey, Brenda. Yes. Um, we had a question that popped up. Um, it is, could you define a little bit more clearly what the those true leaves are when um, when that seed is germinating so they have a better understanding of when they, that fertilize oh, needs to be done? Sure. I went back to the side, this example, this tomato plant, see the really smooth round leaves, rounder, they're oblong, but they don't have the leaf, the shape of the actual tomato leaf. Usually the, the first leaves or the cotyledons are just a real basic shape, like they're just round or oval without any definition, you don't see anything. And then 
the net there and there's two of them and then the very next set that comes up will look totally different than those first two so the first two that come up are the cotyledons they're the temporary leaves and then the next set are what they call the true leaves that actually have the the shape that you would recognize for that plant is that okay okay so once you know that in a week or so you'll probably be planting outside, you can just bring your trays out. You don't want to just stick them in full sun. I, I put mine on the edge of my porch where I know they're going to get just a short bit of sun and they're a little bit sheltered in case it's windy. And I'll leave them out there for an hour or so and each and then take them back in and then each day I'll increase it. And um and you keep a close eye because when it's windier, they might, the water might, they might dry out a little faster. So they might be to be watered a little more than they did in the house. If you grow it in flats instead of cells, about three days before you're going to plant outside, you do what you call block out where you just cut around it. So any of the little roots that are reaching out, you can sever them. So they'll get to have a few days to heal up and be ready to be moved. Uh, so they won't be quite as traumatized in their move. Um, don't feed during the last week, water a little bit less, but then an hour before you're gonna put it outside, water it really well because the roots that get disturbed during the move won't be able to, um, they'll be a little traumatized. They won't be able to take up water as easily. So if you water them first, they won't, it'll, they'll recover before they need water again, hopefully. And the hardest thing is to transplant them late in the day. I usually I'm so excited to get my plants in the ground that I want to get up that morning and get them all in the ground. But it's better to wait till after the heat of the day is gone, unless it's a very cloudy day, you could do it earlier. But but if you can do it after the heat of the day is gone, that way it gives them the whole evening and night and morning to, to be getting situated in their soil before they're exposed to the heat of the day. So that's always hard for me to wait. And so when you're transplanting them outside, try to never handle the stem of the plant. It's so tender that if it gets crushed, all the circulation that's going from the root between the roots and leaves will be destroyed and the plant will die. So if you could just hold it by the leaves and pry up you know, the soil very carefully, then you should have pretty good luck moving them. And the other thing to think about, I'm sure you've, a lot of you have just have experienced this with you get your nice healthy seedlings out and out there and then a couple days later you look out and it looks like somebody took scissors to them and the plants laying on its side and these cutworms get them so you can put a cutworm guard around the stem of each plant i i use the the paper towel or toilet paper rolls i have friends start saving them for me in february so i'll have a whole bunch by march and um and or you can use a piece of newspaper as you can see you can use cups and those work very well to keep the cutworms off the stems of your plants um, i've also i don't have a picture but i've heard you can also if you put a nail right next to the stem it will keep the that caterpillar from wrapping itself around and chewing through so that's about all we had on actually getting the seeds started and getting them in the ground. We have a lot of good sources in our area for seeds. A lot of the local feed stores have bulk seed and they and they are knowledgeable about what varieties do well in our area. And then we have community gardening clubs. We have like Grow Gainesville or High Spring Seed Savers, which hopefully in the next year we'll be getting back in swing. And as you can see, there's there's other organizations online that have a really good selection of seeds that support even you know diversity and heirloom seeds so we have we have some good resources for our seeds um, so the next thing we're going to do is i'm going to show you how you can build a grow light for your plants inside and we have a cost list it is a it's not it's just a slightly old from 2019 and you just need one 10 foot feet of piece of PVC. These are three quarter inch PVC. Um, two T's, four elbows, and a, and a shop lamp. Like I said, it can be a regular fluorescent, you know, the cheapest shop fixture you can find. 
and then two bulbs. And then if you want a timer, so you can leave the light on for the 14 to 18 hours. So really for around $40, you can have a grow light and and you might even have a lot of the stuff laying around and you wouldn't even need to buy it. I know the repurposed store has pieces of PVC and some of the some of the adapters. So we'll be doing that next. I think the next slide is just some references that um, the Vegetable Gardening of Florida book is a great book by James Stevens and we'll be using the the um, grow light pattern from this next IFAS fact sheet that's seed starting under lights and it has all the parts and has step by step how to do it. Another really good guy, I've used it for over 20 years. I used it in South Florida and here. The Florida Vegetable Gardening Guide, this IFAS publication, it has when to do what in different regions of Florida. It tells you, it tells you what varieties do best in our area. I just, I just live by it. I have it in a plastic sleeve that I, that's all grubby and dirty because I use it every time I plant. So I really like that reference. So I guess the next thing we're going to do is demonstrate this grow light. Yeah, Brenda, before we do that, um, someone on YouTube asked um, about the fertilizer. Do you have a preferred fertilizer that you use for the young um, seedlings or once they've germinated? Do you use, like, I'll, I've used like fish emulsion, but we've also used like low grade fertilizers, but I didn't know if there's any that you preferred or like the, what type of grade that you prefer using for your garden well, starts. Fish emulsion's good, but I've also used the blue stuff you know, just bet a quarter strength. I, I mm -hmm. think at this point, you know, I, I, you know, with, with, I'm, once I'm out in the garden, I, I try to concentrate more on maybe some more organic type stuff, but with the um, seed starting, I kind of stick to, I haven't done a lot of experimenting, but the blue stuff or just some, you know, any, I haven't used a specific brand, but it's all, just one of those soluble mixtures but at quarter strength yeah yeah because i know sometimes with like seedlings if you use two some sometimes i know sometimes people will use a higher grade like a 20 10 15 or something so like um it's it's much easier to burn the yes. small young plants of those yes. higher braids so um you that's why i like using fish emulsion because it's a very low grade organic fertilizer and um it takes a lot to really screw up <laughs> That sounds like a great plan. <laughs> so uh, let's go ahead and we'll get the computer set up so you can do the, um, um, so you can do the grow light. Grow light. Yeah, I can't think. Here we go. All right. Get everyone, well, we'll take like just like a quick minute break while we get this set up for everybody. Parts list was one 10 foot piece. So you just need to cut it into four one foot pieces. I have four of those here. Four, did I say, yeah, one foot. And then four six inch pieces. And then you're left with approximately one four foot section and all that's from that one 10 foot section. Then you just need two T's. These are slip T's, they're not threaded. They're just three quarter inch T's. And then you need four of the elbows, which are also slip, not threaded. And a, a fluorescent fixture. And I have, for example, a timer, if you want to use a timer, which you don't have to. So first, I'm going to put together, I'm going to put the two six inch pieces on a T, one for, one for each end. I'm going to connect the four foot piece. Oops, maybe. <laughs> okay. And then the elbows go on each end, and these 12 inch pieces become the, the legs. So 
So we have these four legs. Now for storage, you can, all the pieces except the long piece will easily fit in a shoe box. And then this four foot section of pipe will fit in the box that the uh, lamp came in. So when you're not using it, you can uh, store, easily store the light and the four foot section of tubing in the, in, a, in the box that it came in. And then all the other pieces will fit in a shoe box. So you would just place your plant trays. This four foot light will accommodate two standard size planting trays that you can rotate occasionally because the middle has the most light. And as the plant grows, you just change the link and you can raise and lower the light. And that's how simple it is to build your own grow light. So we're gonna go back, we're gonna continue on talking about compost, unless somebody had a question about this. All right, thank you everybody for bearing with us so we get everything back to uh, how we were situated earlier. But um, I know that we did have some questions and I think it could be worth addressing before um, Brenda talks a little bit about the composting. Um, so there were some questions um there oh one question specifically about the the grow light in itself uh brenda is what are you using to hang the light from from the pvc frame oh good question this little this lightweight chain comes with a light fixture it's just a a really light piece of chain it's real easy to bend with some small pliers and it comes with the fixture and if you had a fixture that didn't have it, you would just get some lightweight chain. You could use tie wraps. You could use just about anything. Yeah, and um, and that's just a regular old fluorescent bulb, correct? That is a fluorescent, regular, like I said, the mm -hmm. T12, T8 shot bulb. You do not need um, the full spectrum light, grow light in order to start plants just for that six week period. And they're gonna go outside afterwards. Yeah, absolutely, great. Um, so I know there's some, a couple of other questions that I have on here and we'll just those, I'm um, going back to like when you're trying to start some of the seeds. Um, and you, I know you talked about covering the seeds, um, with like a plastic wrap. I know sometimes you get those little domes that you can sit over the containers that you let them grow. Um, you know, do you have to make sure that you take those off periodically to allow them to breathe as well oh. as, are there any other precautions that you do to make sure that the, the oh, seeds that's have- Good Oxygen. question. Yeah. Usually you do not have to remove those until until germination. Um, usually, so you do, they, if they stay sealed, you'll see all the condensation forming in it and that's what you want. And they, so until germination, you don't need to remove the lid. And it's, but just keep a close eye. As soon as you see something green popping out, you can remove it. So you do not need to take it off until germination. Perfect. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Brenda. Um, and let's see. Mm -hmm. And the timer that you use, that's just a timer that you put into the wall plug? Yes, it's just like a, um, it's for lamps. It's like what you would use for light or an, your coffee pot <laughs> or, or something like that. Just it plugs into the outlet and then the cord to the light would plug into it and you would set it to come on and off as you wanted. Perfect. So when you, um, and then the last question that's related to this is when you put multiple seeds in one cell, um, do you let all of them grow or you just wait till you have one really strong one and remove the others? I, let, I remove the others. I leave one strong one. It is so hard, but you can compost those or feed them to your chickens <laughs> or sometimes put them in your salad. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I don't know. It depends on what you don't, might not know what they're growing, what exactly is in the mix. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. Very true. All right. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. I think we can move forward with the next part. And I know I end up having some more questions come through in a bit. So okay. thank you very much, Brenda. Yeah. All righty. So now we'll go on to some composting tips. This is, you know, just quite kind of a quick review here. But first, just to define composting, it's the controlled decomposition of organic matter by microorganisms. Um, and 
you know, why do we want to compost? Uh, the benefits of composting, it's very, it's sustainable on your property. It's environmentally sound where you can make garbage turn into something useful. It also <laughs> reduces the amount of, of waste that has to be driven away. Um, it, it makes it, it, it's an excellent product. I mean, it's really, really good soil amendment and it's free. Uh, you can use it to make your own potting soil if you want to mix it with other components. Some people use compost and they brew it with water to make tea to water their plants. And it's pretty easy and it's it can be fun <laughs> depending on what you think is fun. Um, some more benefits. It will actually improve the structure of sandy soil or clay soil. It helps retain water and nutrients so the plant it can use them and it, it'll keep them so they can continue to use that water and nutrients later like with our sandy soil and I know some areas around here clay the water will go th through that sandy soil and just be gone. It helps buffer pH it'll neutralize the soil so however pH your soil is that is not supposed to be if you uh, put compost it will buffer into a more neutral so that uh, nutrient uptake is enhanced. It increases life in your soil that will be a healthier soil there you're going to have more earthworms fungi and uh, beneficial bacteria. It can help decrease diseases and nematodes and it also helps convert nitrogen that's in the soil so into a form that plants can use. So if you're to compost a home, there's a few things that you need to consider. You need to pick a location, you need to choose a container, and then you need to assemble your compost pile, you need to maintain it, and then you need to harvest it and use it. So for selecting a location, you, you want to pick a level area, because you're going to be making a pile or putting a container on it, and you want it to be well drained and near a water source because as we'll talk about in a few minutes we do need moisture for our compost and you want a couple of feet from any structure it's going to be you know damp and decomposing stuff you don't really want up next to your house or a fence or some other structure and have it pretty close to where for the from the source if you had to hike you know a half a mile just to put your kitchen scraps and compost you probably aren't likely to continue composting for long. And then once you have a location picked out, you want to pick a container. And well, the first thing is you don't really need a container. You can you can just use a pile. You know, even though we're going to talk about a lot of methods, if you pile up organic material, it's going to turn into compost <laughs> one way or the other. But um, if you manage it, it'll get there faster. So if you um, don't use a container, you can just mount it into a pile. And um, a lot of times people will put fresh kitchen scraps maybe underneath and put drier stuff on top just to help deter pests when it's not in a container. Um, there's a lot of different containers you can use. There's really nice commercial containers. You can just use a ring of wire, which you can get a composting wire bin for free at the um, the uh, oh shoot now it left my mind the waste tailor. management yeah waste management <laughs> sorry yeah <laughs> they will give you a free compost bin it's a rolled up piece of wire and then it will you can expand it to hold compost like in that picture with the wire and um, or you can you know build you can build your own there's a lot of different ways the size needs to be um, at least one cubic yard because it needs to get hot in the middle and needs to be that size to get hot enough to finish the compost. And you want to be able to add and remove when you're deciding on a design, you want to be able to put stuff in and to take stuff out. You want to be able to mix it and, you know, keep in mind if you're, if you're concerned with uh, different creatures accessing it, pets or wildlife. And this is just a few different varieties. A lot of people have that have made their compost bins out of pallets, which has worked real well. And then, you know, some people get very creative, as you can see. And then there's also several commercial varieties. So once you're ready to start assembling your materials, it, you, to start off, one good thing to know is that 
that the microorganisms, they will start decomposing under certain environmental conditions. So they need, in order to really stay active, they need food, they need moisture, they need oxygen, and they need to have a certain temperature. And then under those certain conditions, then decomposition will occur. So there's two groups of materials we usually put in. One are the carbon rich materials, we'll just call browns. They are an energy source for the microbes. They're usually drier, they degrade slowly, then they're bulky, they help aerate. And um, if they were just put around, if they're used with by themselves, they could actually cause nitrogen deficiency because this bulky, slowly degrading material actually consumes nitrogen as it breaks down. So you, it would take nitrogen away from the plant, but, but we're using it as an ingredient. So those are the browns. Here are some examples, straw, pine needles, wood chips, what you can see, even drier lint. I keep meaning to try that and I haven't yet. I need to throw that out there. But these are the, dry, the carbon sources or browns. And then the other half of the materials for the compost are what we call greens, which are nitrogen rich materials. And they're used by the microbes for protein synthesis and reproduction. They, are very, they have a high moisture content. They break down really fast. They compact easily. They can really squish down. That's why it's good to have those browns with them because that'll help aerate them. And, uh, and also the greens are the things that can be smelly. Some sources for, for the greens, grass clippings, garden waste, vegetable scraps, eggshells, coffee grounds, tea bags, hair, feathers, all of those are high nitrogen that will help with the decomposition. Now, we'll talk a little about ratios because certain different browns and greens have a different ratio of, of um, nitrogen in them. But you don't really need to know any of that. All you need to know is that if you use one part brown to one part green, you will end up with approximately a 30 to one nitrogen ratio and that'll be good. So just for every time you add browns, try to add greens as well. You know, that's what you'll get a good balance in your pile. And you can use manure in your compost pile. It, it's again, since it's a high nitrogen and it can really compact easy, you really might wanna mix it with straw and and also just keep in mind where the manure came from if it's because some feeds some hay products have uh, herbicides on them that can even survive passing through the animal and then you could actually be putting herbicide in your compost and obviously your plants won't grow very well like that so kind of be aware of if you are using manure the feed source there are commercial wastes you can use in your compost if you have access to it. I've never really used, I guess, depending on where you live, if there's industrial things like rice hulls, hops, fruit waste, some sawdust. Sawdust can really pack down. So if you use sawdust, really, you need to put a lot of um, bulky things with it. Feathers, wood ash. I have used ash just from, from burning from firewood, tree trimmings and waste from the grocery store and all those. Now, things to avoid. Um, animal products are going to create odors and attract pests. So usually not meat or dairy, oil, greasy food, any plants that are treated with pesticides, um, not pre no pressure treated wood, and really hard materials like nutshells, oyster shells, or really big sticks because they just don't break down. You also, you know, we were talking about manure, but I was talking about livestock manure. I should have said that. You really don't want to put in your in your home compost pile your pet feces. They can have uh, parasites and bacteria that you don't really want to be using in your yard. And so I know people have heard of composting human feces and pet feces, but under certain conditions, you know, I'm sure that's doable, and it would have to be very well managed and very carefully the temperature managed to make sure things are killed, but it's just not recommended for our for homeowner composting. Also, you it's fine to use ash from hardwood that's burned, but you don't want to use coal ash or barbecue briquettes because they have they have iron and sulfur in them and they have flammable chemicals that you don't really want in your compost. 
Also, you might want to avoid weeds with a bunch of seeds on them and diseased plant material. Now, technically, your the, the compost pile does get very hot and inside. And um, so it will potentially kill disease and weed seeds. But if you, depending on how closely you manage your pile, you might just want to avoid some of that stuff. But um, keep that in mind. And also any um, like plastics or synthetics that are shredded up, they're not going to degrade very well. And say floor sweepings, urban floor sweepings might have lead. And if you had like a huge amount, if you got like surplus from somewhere of food with a lot of preservatives in it, it might not be a good idea to have in your compost. So now we talked about what goes in it. Now we're going to talk about actually assembling it. If you start your pile with some twigs or branches, then that lets air circulate. And then if you just layer, if you have a, you know, if you have a pile or bucket of your browns and your greens, you can just alternate the layers, like three to four inches. Then in water, each layer, just moisten it, don't need to soak it. And then top it with a brown or bulky layer, like we said before, it kind of keeps um, pests away. And the size of the um, clippings and stuff, it, this, the, the smaller the size, the faster it's going to decompose. So really, it should be two inches is ideal. Um, and you can shred newspapers, shred palm fronds, like big woody things like a palm frond, um, coarsely chop vegetable matter. For leaves, you can run over them with a lawnmower, and that will help them degrade faster. But you don't want it small like powder, because then it'll just pack together and not really that won't get enough oxygen to it and it won't decompose properly. And then to maintain it, you just want to turn it regularly. Um, that exposes everything in the pile to plenty of moisture and oxygen and it'll just, it'll speed up your rate of decomposition. You can use a, a pitchfork, a piece of rebar, or you can actually buy probes that are for compost piles. Um, and we mentioned before, if you're adding greens, if you put it in the center, it might help, you know, keep pests away. The, the since the center of the pile is the hottest, by mo by mo turning it regularly, you're exposing what we talked about before: weed seeds or disease pathogens. You know, if you turn it all the time, then they'll all be exposed to that really hot temperature in the middle. And you can turn it every two weeks, or you can never turn it. It's it's going to degrade. It'll go faster if you turn it a lot. And if you don't, it will still degrade, especially in Florida. With our temperature and our moisture content, <laughs> it degrades. But um, but turning it regularly, you'll definitely get compost faster. And, and as we already said, the microbes, they do need moisture in order to be active. And so you can tell if it's wet enough, you can squeeze a handful of it. It should be moist, but not soggy. And, um, in, a, and in Florida here, we can, if it, in the really rainy season, it'll just wash all the nutrients and everything right out of it. So you can just throw a tarp or an old shower curtain or something over it when it's really rainy to just keep it from leaching through. And you can also, if it seems too wet, you can add dry material and turn it. Hey, Brenda, yes. um, I know that it can really vary, of course, um, but how often do you end up turning uh, your compost pile? Oh, I don't manage mine really closely, but it still works. Um, <laughs> I would say may not even once a month. Yeah. Yeah. Because like, I know like it depends really, I guess, how, how quickly it's decomposing. Because if you have a really active pile you would probably have to turn it a little bit more frequently um because like sometimes when you turn your compost it's allowed to bring more oxygen back mm -hmm. into the compost to get the get that decomposition process to get going so um you know but obviously you just want to turn it every single day so it's kind of like a good help maintain temperature and get oxygen in. So I don't know. I don't know if there's a good answer for that. Like, Well, I think <laughs> about two weeks is recommended. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I did when we lived 
before we moved up here and had more room, I had one of those barrel composters that you turn, you know, we just had a regular yard and we put yard clippings and kitchen scrap. And I actually put the kitchen scraps in, a, in an old, I had an old blender that was just for my compost stuff. Yeah. And it, so I put in small clippings and I turned it almost every day. And I had black soil, you know, compost in just a matter of weeks. Oh, but wow. that was really small particles and turned regularly. Yeah. So there, you can't turn it too much. So it's like a weird balance of getting that temperature. Yeah. 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 But two weeks, I think that would probably be a good recommendation. Mm -hmm. and then, I think two weeks is a recommendation. And then just monitor your temperature. If you're too cool, you can turn it. If it's too hot, don't turn it as much. Because like 120, 130 degrees. Yeah. You don't want it over 140. There you go. Yeah. And some people use thermometers in their compost mm -hmm. and really manage it closely but you can compost without doing that. You know, I don't yeah. want people to think they have to go out and buy a thermometer <laughs> no. in order to have a compost pile. <laughs> um, but, you, but, but you know exactly what's going on and you might know if, well, the temperature starts dropping, it's time to turn it. Yeah. But I wasn't, yeah, so. Thank you, that's good, mm -hmm. yeah. So, okay, let's see, for, to make sure you have plenty of oxygen, you. That's what the bulky materials are for, because if you have a bunch of wet, goopy stuff, that's when the oxygen's not going to get in there, and it's going to just get smelly. And um, if it gets like that, if you detect an odor and it seems real wet, then just put in the, the bulky things, the twigs or wood chips or straw, and turn it. Usually, if you're having a problem with your compost, it's turn it, <laughs> and that will probably fix it out. And if it's real wet, add dry stuff. If it's too dry, add wet stuff. Oh, so we do, we are talking about temperature a little bit. Um, as the, the microbes are real active, it raises the temperature. And to kill weed seeds, it needs to be over 130 for three days. And to get to that temperature, you need a good cubic yard of material, like three by three by three, in order for the middle to get that hot. And it has here optimal decomposition is about a 125. And then once it gets much higher, then the 130, it's going to decline. It's like those microbes don't like to live at that temperature. So they're just, they're going to start dropping off. So if you see that it's getting too hot, you know, turn it, add more bulky stuff. And if it's not hot enough, you know, add your greens, your nitrogen, and turn it again, and it should probably pick up. And if it's too dry, add some water. And you can put starters in your compost pile. You can buy a starter and I have never done that. If you just put some, a few, a, a shovel full of your regular compost in, there's enough microbes in there to do it. I think if you live somewhere really cold where your compost area was frozen solid all winter, it might be hard to get it going. I don't think we have that trouble in Florida, but they do sell it if you feel like you need it. But you, you can use just your, a few shovelfuls of your own compost, it will start it. And a few little tips on maintaining, keep a pitchfork handy or whatever you turn it with, keep it there. And so you don't have to go get it. And you're more likely to turn it more often if you don't have to take a trip somewhere to get the tool you need. And um, we said already, if you cover with the leaves or the bulkier browns to avoid pests, water and turn the pile at the same time with a friend. So recruit somebody and it's a lot easier with two people. And Another thing about maintaining, if, if critters are an issue for you, whether it's pets or wildlife in your area, the commercial ones are really good that totally keep critters out. Um, or you can build your own using wire on the top or the hardware cloth makes a really good cover. And to not put meats and fats should keep, you know, as far, especially your pets, you know, we'll keep your pets away from that. Because there can be a lot of things in your compost that your dogs should not eat. So I always, I really make sure I have a barrier for our compost. <clears throat> and ants, if you see ants in your compost, it's probably too dry, too, too cool. So add greens, flooding it, and um, they should probably take care of it. If it doesn't, you could actually try to dig the mound out and remove the whole colony, you know, find the queen and get rid of it. But I have, in my experience, it's been just dry when I have ants. So when you're trying to figure out when your compost is done, the main thing is that you don't recognize anything more. You don't see a piece like, oh, there's an eggshell or there's a piece of 
you know, orange rind or something like that. It's, it, it just looks like soil, it's soil like dark, and it doesn't smell moldy or rotten. It just smells like good dirt, <laughs> earthy. Um, and the, the pile won't be hot anymore because if it's done decomposing, it's, there's no more food in there. It's the microbes are going to not have anything to eat. So that's going to, the activity will slow down and it'll cool off. So when you um, think you want to be using, if your compost is ready to use, then stop adding anything to it. Because if you keep adding stuff to it, there's going to be all that new stuff in there that's not decomposed yet. So start a new pile. It's really nice if you have have always have a couple going so one just leave that one for a good month and just start your next pile and then in about a month it's what you can do is just screen the compost and that picture on top it looks exactly like what i have but it's not a picture of mine my husband just built me that uh, hardware cloth screen i put it on my wheelbarrow and shovel my compost in and any of the big chunks that don't go through just put that in the new compost pile and you've got you a wheelbarrow full of wonderful amendment for your soil. <clears throat> and there's different ways you can use the compost. You can work it right into your plant beds in the top three inches. You can put it around shrubs in your landscaping. You can make your own potting mix. You can actually use it on turf, about three quarter inch broadcast over your turf. You can use it in the soil before grass seed or sod. And like we mentioned before, you can make a tea for your plants with it. And there's actually a couple of tea recipes here and which again you will have access to these slides so you don't have to try to remember the slide or take a picture of it. You'll have access to it. So that is the end of the tips of the compost and there is an IFAS publication on compost tips for the home gardener. And there's all other websites, as you see, for, for composting. And as always, you can contact the Master Gardener hotline. There's the Facebook page for Master Gardeners. And we, sh we should be able to answer your questions. And if we don't know the answer, we'll find somebody who does. And you'll be getting evaluation form emailed to you. Please fill that out. And thank you for listening to our presentation today. All right. Well, Brenda, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, and, you know, we will, we'll get all this material and everything sent out to everybody through email, but I know we still have some time left that we would love to uh, be able to help answer any uh, questions um, that anyone may have. Um, and I know uh, Brenda talked a lot about composting and we also on our YouTube page, and we'll send that link out. Um, we have a bunch of old webinars from uh, the past months, um, but we have one from a few months ago. I think it was uh, July or August, I can't remember, but we had a bigger program on composting. So you can always learn more information from there um, because I know like Brenda hit the tip of the iceberg when it comes to composting. Yeah, there's um, so but, much. <laughs> so, um, but we'll, we'll follow up with more resources and more information. So feel free to put some of the questions that you have um, in, in the chat box. Uh, that will be a great way uh, for us to kind of help answer some of those. And I'm going to try to relay some of the, because I've been monitoring our YouTube page at the same time. So I'll try to relay some of those YouTube questions over as well. Um, so one of the questions that, um, that we can kind of catch up on is, um, let's see, let me, st I'll start at the top. Um, so going back to seed starting, how often do you water your plants before and after uh, germination? Once they've germinated, I just really keep a close eye. And if it starts to, when the soil starts to dry out, is when I do it. And it would depend on, you know, where, where, what room of your house it's in, or if it's outside, just the moisture content, but just really keep a close eye on it and do not, and when it starts to dry out a little, that's when I water it. You know, but you don't want it to get there for that whole cell to dry because the plant will not survive that. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a day, a number of days. I just, you have to keep an eye on them because they're so little and vulnerable. Yeah, understandable. Um, so uh, let's see. Oh, there was um, one question about, uh, and maybe like Colin or Ruth or anybody, any of the master gardeners can kind of tune in or chime in if you have any responses to this, but what about dampening off? 
um, any of the the seed the seedlings? Well, if you use one thing that really helps is to make sure you use sterile soil. Use that sterile seed starting mix. Don't use potting soil because potting soil isn't necessarily sterilized. Mm -hmm. And because um, I've had that happen when I just was starting to learn to start seeds that I've, I had that happen and turning the fan on in the room. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, um, so, and that's pretty much that, that the dampening off is a, is a disease. Oh yeah, the stem will yeah. get, get, will just get soggy, like moldy. It'll get like a mold because it's a fungus. Mm -hmm. or um and it just die it just shrivels up and the plant falls over yeah perfect that's great because that's a common thing and like um there was a question that we had on youtube earlier where someone was asking about reusing the soil um usually i recommend replacing it for things just like this there could be funguses or other bacteria or pathogens that can end up in the soil and you don't want to unintentionally spread that to the next years or that next group of seeds that you um, are planting I use leftover, you know, the seed, since the seed mix is specific from the um, differently different from the potting soil, I'll use that other places in my yard where I just want some soil where it's not, if it's an, like even out in the grass, like if there's a sandy spot, just because it's not going to damage the grass, you know, the grass is mature and established and the pathogens and I wouldn't start, I wouldn't start new plants in used, in used yeah. soil, you know, an old mature plant, I don't know, it'd be bad. It's not worth taking a chance, huh? Correct. Yeah. Um, let's see. So how would you, you know, do you do any cold protection? Cause I know you're doing this indoors, but have you ever done any outdoors, say like a garage or anything like that? When you're doing any seed starting, do you worry yourself with cold protection or do you just typical, just, just throw a sheet kind of over to give it a little protection? Well, I've, if, the temperature is less than 50 in your garage it's going to be hard to get the seeds to start they mm -hmm. need those like a daytime temperature in the 60s or 70s and the nights above 50 so it's probably better to do it in the, well depending on where you live it you might not have a really good success outside unless maybe with a heat mat if you have the if you use one of those heat mats that goes under the tray then you might be okay yeah. So we get the cooler temperatures. It might not do anything to the seeds in themselves, but they're not going to germinate at those cooler temperatures because you need to have that ideal temperature. Correct. Yeah. It's one of the triggers, you know, for mm -hmm. for certain seeds. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so I know we're sort of thinking about starting some of the seeds um, now. Um, what type of seeds are you starting now? Are you starting seeds now that you're thinking for your spring garden? Absolutely. That's what I'll probably in another week. Um, well, so tomatoes are good. Toma if you're not going to plant like up pot tomatoes like three times into bigger pot and bigger pot, they they do well to be transplanted after six weeks. So so if I'm planning in, in the middle of March to put my I want tomato seedlings in my garden, on February 1st, I'm going to be planting my tomato seeds and putting them under, you know, in, in my flats because they'll be six weeks old when our last frost is suspect, expected and I will be able to put, I will have six week old seedlings to put outside. You could start sooner, but at six weeks for tomatoes example, they don't, they like to be potted up again after six weeks. So some people, you know, might start now and in six weeks put them in a bigger pot and then you know, that would be all have to be protected inside before they put them outside. But I aim to have it ready to put outside in the middle of March. So look at your seed packet, tomatoes, six weeks. Peppers take a little, for me, take a little longer. So I usually start to put peppers like eight weeks. So I'm going to be in the next week or so planting pepper seeds in, in my cells to get ready to put under my lights. And then around the 1st of February, I'll be doing tomatoes. And then I start flowers and um, I start some herbs too, just to get a head start, certain mm -hmm. things, but tomatoes and peppers are the main thing that I want to get in there as soon as I can <laughs> to beat the uh, heat. So they'll be mature before it gets too hot. Yeah. And I, uh, I, I know I'm kind of jumping all around a bit because um, I'm just, the questions are coming in from all over, but um would some of the questions I saw on on here as well as uh, on YouTube is we had some questions that relate to 
like do you have much experience i guess brenda doing the composting like it's that lasagna composting or where you're doing this the you're just layering it up it's like the permaculture process for composting i haven't done that but i definitely know people who have done that using the method that you read the lasagna right, with really good results yeah and essentially it's just like you're putting down like a newspaper cardboard mm -hmm. as one of the weeds and then you're just alternating layers of your greens and your browns and then leaving it and just leaving it for mm -hmm. a period of time right yeah That's, yeah and you're not really turning and you can you end up planting directly into that right but so. but it with the left time and especially in florida i feel like that would um I know people who have done that in Florida, in our part of the state. Um, oh, me too. Yeah, and that's so called was, that it, no dig gardening or mm -hmm. uh, lasagna gardening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mm -hmm. like that term. It's just yeah. fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. Um, oh, do you, th this is a great question, because this is something that we always have to deal with, is do you reuse any of your, like, your plastic flats or anything like yes. that? Yeah. I use them. I use them over. I leave them. I hose them out real good and I leave them out in the sun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I know you can also just like get just basic disinfectant. And yeah. You can A always just spray bleach. them down. Yeah. 10% 10% will kill pathogens. Mm -hmm. And that's a good way to reuse them because mm -hmm. a lot of those like black trays and containers that we see a lot with, with uh, gardens, that is not. Um, recyclable so it's better to try to reuse them or repurpose them um just because of that reason so if you can sterilize them and reuse them absolutely yeah yeah i've reused those for years i don't ever um get rid of them until they till they crack and break and i <laughs> have to get rid of them <laughs> yeah when you pick it up and just falls apart yes <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have any recommendations for keeping bugs away from um, the compost pile? Hmm. I haven't. Does anyone else ever out there? This ha I've never had a lot of trouble. I've had trouble. I've had ants before, which I dressed that was too dry. I, you know, our yard. I live in a rural area in real woodsy, and I've never had any bugs that I mind. I, I guess since I don't live on a real small property where it's real close to my house and I worry about what's in it I haven't I mean I know there's those big wood roaches that are in our mulch and around everything out there it's like that's normal it's normal and as <laughs> you know and I, I'm so excited if I see grubs or I should say worms in the pile I'm just you know I'm glad you know so mm -hmm. I oh I is I don't know if Colin's still there if, if I haven't had trouble with bugs that I didn't want in my compost pile, I guess. I guess so right. usually like some bugs, some of the insects are some of the things that you might see in your compost. So actually will, could be very beneficial. Yes. So like, it really depends on what it is. Yeah. Um, but usually just turning it and making sure that it's, you've got a good balance of your moisture will help get them out. But sometimes when you're seeing like the bad things in there, um, it could be because you have like food waste or other things like that because I've heard like people putting like some of their food waste in there and then maggots are made their way inside and it's just flies galore all over their compost pile because of it um so like yeah. things like that so food or things that would spoil bury like, it real deep like down in the center and cover it up with other stuff yeah because I know um like one question earlier was can you put eggshells in and yes. it's like, yeah yeah you absolutely can I just make sure I like rinsing them all I recommend just rinsing them off to get any of the egg off because that can attract things but the shell is great one of the one of the tricks with eggshells is to put them in a paper towel and just crush them up and uh, put them in your compost and that break helps them break down faster and the paper towel absorbs any any uh, leftover uh, white. Oh, that's a good idea. That's a very good idea. Yeah. Um, and uh, the other thing about compost is, is if you, uh, a lot of people, uh, if they dig up worm, find a worm when they're digging stuff, to toss it on the compost. I always do that, and that helps it break mm -hmm. down faster. Mm -hmm. And I never worry about any bugs on mine. If the only bad time is with compost, if it does smell bad, it means you have anaerobic decomposition and you do need to turn it. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So um, we'll try to answer a couple more questions here because we still got quite a few that popped up. But um, before we do that, um, I did send it out earlier. Um, I have, we have a, a 
a survey that we like to always send out with all of our programs. Um, and this is just that we use to help improve the programs. Just a few, uh, just a couple questions. Um, I'm going to put the link in the chat box. Um, I already sent it once, but I'll send it again and I'll put it on our, uh, the YouTube page as well for everybody. Um, but um, that survey, it's just a way that we use to help improve all of our programs. So we take what we learn and we use that into the future. Um, but before we finish off to answer some of these more, some more questions, I just want to really thank Brenda and the other Master Gardeners for coming in and helping out. And I want to thank everybody for coming today. Um, so 